Welcome everyone. I'm Kat Lloyd, Vice President of Programs here at the Tenement Museum. Thank you so much for joining us for tonight's Tenement Talk on the new release, The Last Million, Europe's Displaced People from World War II to the Cold War. We're here tonight in the recreated home of Kalman and Rivka Epstein at 103 Orchard Street. In this tenement apartment, they raised two daughters, Bella and Blima, and created a Jewish home for their family on the Lower East Side in the 1950s. Making a home was particularly meaningful for the Epsteins. Both Kalman and Rivka were among the thousands of Holocaust survivors with nowhere to go after the end of the war. They made it to New York only through a change to U.S. immigration law and the sponsorship of the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society. In New York, they rebuilt lives for themselves piece by piece through work in the garment industry, the support of an aunt and uncle, and finding a community of other Holocaust survivors. Their daughter Bella recalls her parents placing mezuzahs, like this one, Jewish pair of skulls on their doorways, a sign of their bravery to mark their home as a Jewish home and their faith in the United States as a place where they could be Jewish. The Last Million examines the struggles of people like the Epsteins in rebuilding and the failures of the international community during this crisis. In the 21st century, there are more displaced people globally than at any other time since World War II. And tonight's conversation will draw connections through to experiences and responses today. It's an honor to welcome author and historian David Nassau to the program tonight. He'll be joined by Mark Hetfield, director of HIAS, the International Refugee Resettlement Organization, and Dr. Annie Polland, Tenement Museum president. You're welcome to join the conversation too. Share your questions and connections in the chat and we'll pass them along to our guests. We're so grateful for your generous support. By making a donation of any size of the link in the description below, you allow us to continue offering programming like this and continue to rebuild. To stay in touch with the museum, visit tenement.org for information on virtual and in-person programs, becoming a member, and more. Thanks again for joining us, and I hope you enjoyed tonight's conversation. I'm with David Nassau, historian and author of The Last Million, and Mark Hetfield, CEO and president of HIAS. And we're going to talk tonight about the Epstein family who lived in this apartment. They came here um, in 1947. But before we do, I want, and, and they were helped by Hyas. Um, before we do, I just wanted to kind of start with this book, which is a, a magnificent book and such a wonderful contribution and one that's, that's going to help us interpret and reinterpret this exhibit. But I wanted to start just by asking you, David, why you wrote this book. Many people think of world, what inspired you to write the book? Many people think of World War II as like the end of World War II is the end of the story. So what was your point of departure? You know, I, I don't, I, I still haven't figured out <laughs> the, the inspiration of what got me there. Mm -hmm. I know that I had written a book about Joseph Kennedy and I knew that for the Kennedy family, and this is, you know, sounds ridiculous, but true, for the Kennedy family, the, the war did not end on VE Day or VJ Day. The losses for this, you know, first family of America continued for the rest of their lives. Um, because Joe Jr., the heir apparent who was going to be the first mm -hmm. Irish Catholic president, never made it home. In my own family, I had an uncle I never met who never made it home, who was killed at the, at the end of the war. And I was supposed to have been named. I should have been Robert Nassau. And Lillian Nassau, who opened a wonderful, ran a wonderful Tiffany store in New York, she said, I don't want my nephew to have that name. I want to save it for my son's, my living son's child. Um, so I knew that in my own family and in all of these families, liberation didn't mean the end of suffering. And as I began to look at this, I remembered all the survivors who I had met and their families. And at some point in time, the conversation went to, well, when did you come to New York? And the answers were 47, a few of them, 48, 49, 50. And it struck me like a thunderbolt late in my career after I'd written all sorts of other stuff. Where were they? Mm 
And as a historian, and as a Jew, I must confess to this abysmal ignorance. And I had to atone for that ignorance by spending years and years and years writing this book. Because I thought, like so many others, that when liberation came and the camps were opened, America opened its heart and its wallet and its gates and said to the survivors, welcome. Um, there is a hidden chapter in immigration history, in Jewish history, in the history of Israel, in refugee history, in the history of World War II and the Cold War. And that is the story of the displaced persons camps of the last million, of the quarter million Jewish survivors and three quarters of a million refugees who found their way or who were kidnapped and transported into Germany at the end of the war and for a variety of reasons, all different reasons, either had no homes to return to like the Jews or were frightened to go home because they didn't know what it would be like to live under Soviet domination or because they had collaborated mm -hmm. and they knew that going home to Latvia or Lithuania or Romania or Ukraine would mean that they would be brought to justice for their crimes. It was safer to hide in Germany and to make believe that they too were victims. So that's the story that I, I felt, I guess, sort of obligated to learn and then to tell. And in many ways, there was, you, you, sometimes in, read, in this book, I imagined you as a, a big you know, traffic director, right? Because <laughs> there's streams of people coming from all of these different directions. Yeah. And then there's also the different parties, right? The US government, the British government, um, the government that would take shape in what was in Palestine and what would become Israel. Uh, you know, Australia, all of these countries kind of involved. And then you have all the organizations and the UN and uh, HIAS also kind of trying to figure out like what was going to happen with all these streams of people and all these parties trying to kind of figure it out. Um, I'm curious for you, Mark, reading this book, and you knew that, you know, you obviously know this history because it's something that you've been working on and you've been meeting, um, you know, the survivors who came that Hyas helped and that's part of your career. What did you learn from reading this book that was something that was new about this time period? Well, it, it, how little things have changed, mm -hmm. to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and, and one thing that's important to say about, about the book and why it's so important for the context today, and, and it was interesting how David said that the, the war didn't really end, right, for many people, for the Kennedys, for, for his family, for many families, and it still hasn't ended for refugees. Because the, the 1951 Refugee Convention, you know, which is the entire framework for protecting refugees, um, it came out of that era. And it is still stuck in that era. I mean, it was written, the 1951 Refugee Convention was written um, to deal with the disposition of the last million. And until 1967, the Refugee Convention only referred to refugees displaced in Europe in 1951, right? It was only updated in 1967 to the rest of the world. And it was never updated to deal with the post-Cold War era that we are now in. So we talk about climate refugees. There's no such thing under the Refugee Convention. The refugees who are fleeing uh, Central America, um, you know, gang violence, failed states, not really a good fit for the Refugee Convention because it was written about World War II. But because the, the generosity that existed at that time, the guilt maybe that existed at that time, isn't with us anymore. And so we are stuck in this situation where we don't have solutions for today's refugees because the, the instrument 
was written in 1951 without the will to carry it out. And what gives me hope about this, I mean, it's in the title of David's book, which is The Last Million, right? Like, eventually, solutions were found for The Last Million. Today, we, you know, I have to correct one thing that was said in the introduction was um, that we have the largest refugee crisis since World War II. That was true Surpassed. five years ago. Today, we have the largest refugee crisis ever. We have more forcibly displaced persons in the world right now than we have ever had in human history. And, they, and the reason is because none of them are finding solutions. Just every year, there are more refugee crises that add to the number of refugees and forcibly displaced persons. There's no last million. There's another million and another million and another and million. And it's going to keep going. Yeah. Well, by the end of this hour, hopefully we'll have a solution to it. But I want to. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought go, I can retire. But. I want to go. But, but, but everything that you're raising reminds me of our visitors who come on this tour and they learn about the Epstein's. And you know, our mission is to connect past to present. But we don't have to do. We don't have to say now we're going to turn to the present because the visitors themselves bring it up. You know, they they hear the story and it prompts them to think about what is happening today. So you know, going back to the Epstein's, one of the things that was kind of helpful for me in thinking about this family um, is thinking about how their lives intersected with legislation that was written and legislation that was not written. Um, and we had been telling the story in, in somewhat of a hopeful light. We talked about them being able to come here. So they were both uh, uh, went, to, they ended up at Zielsheim. They married, I think, in, in March of 1947. They had had previous families before they met in the displaced persons camp, and that was very common. Um, and then uh, for all for the new new matches to happen, and then um, they were able to make it here, and they came under Truman's executive order um, that allowed some people to come over, but a very small number of people. We had kind of celebrated that on this tour, in the sense that you know, and I think we have a, qu have a quote. This is what Truman said: "This is the opportunity for America to set an example for the rest of the world in cooperation toward alleviation, alleviating human misery." So we kind of we were able to frame this in. Okay, here's the bad news: in 1945, uh, a Gallup poll showed that 95 percent of Americans did not want immigration laws changed. And of course, these are immigration laws that have been keeping people out since 1924, and then in other forms before that. Um, and, and when they did list who they wanted to get come into the country, they put like Scandinavians first. So we told that part of the story. But then we said at Truman, even though Congress didn't want to pass legislation at the time, Truman passes this executive order alleviating human misery and sets an example and, and lets them in. Now, your book complicates that. And then there's more to the story with the DP, DP uh, Refugee Act. But take us through that a little well, bit. Your take on Truman at the time. What were his options? One of the things that, as a historian, mm -hmm. I learned a long, long time ago is don't trust the words of politicians, <laughs> of elected officials. Is that still true today? <laughs> <laughs> you know, wh when I read, um, and you may have referenced this as well, when President Biden came out with his special plan the Ukrainian refugees. Well, it has a name to what is it called? Um, Operation you, something? You, well, you for you, Unite for Ukraine. Unite. Um, and it sounded wonderful. But then you do a little big <laughs> bit of digging, and you know this better than I. Yeah. And it's not a wonderful plan. It's not going to solve the crisis. It is going to solve a political crisis for the Biden administration, mm -hmm. but it's not going to solve the crisis. The same was true with mm -hmm. Truman's declaration in December of 1945. Mm -hmm. It was a joke, mm -hmm. and everybody at the time knew that it was a joke. Mm -hmm. Truman was not going to change the quota system. Mm -hmm. He couldn't, though. Wouldn't he have needed Congress? He would have needed Congress. Yeah. But the Declaration didn't change the quota system in any way, shape, or form, which meant that I think 2,000 Poles would be allowed in. Truman could have used the unused quotas by executive order that hadn't been used during the war. Mm -hmm. He could have used those to bring in displaced persons. But he didn't. Mm 
And he didn't say we have a real crisis here. He didn't say we've got to get the British to open Palestine. He didn't say Congress has to act. He said we're doing this wonderful thing. In the end, 15,000 German Jews came into this country out of a quarter million. Mm -hmm. 25,000 refugees entered the country out of a million. <laughs> I mean, and in order to get into this country, like the, the Epstein family, mm -hmm. most of those who came in lied. They forged papers. Well, that was, I mean, that was a stunning part of the book, really, to kind of see the way in which, because things were changing all the time, you had to lie. Right? You, had, you, yeah. you could not, you, you had to lie in order to, you know, have, find shelter. You had to lie in order to kind of, and, and but the, the lies would have to keep changing, too. That's what made it difficult, you know. There is such, the, yeah, yeah, there is such wonderful stuff. Do you, do you know um, Joe Berger? Do you know uh, Joe Berger? No, no. Joe Berger was the New York Times education editor, and uh -huh. he wrote a wonderful book about his family. Um, he was born in, well, he didn't know where he was born. Let, let me not get ahead of myself in the story. At one point, he was going to City College. He was, his family was helped by Hyas. Um, they were settled and resettled and put in an apartment and given their first food that they needed and helped to get a job, the, the father. Um, Joe grew up, you know, in America when it was time to go to City College. They needed his, he needed his birth certificate. So he went to his mother and said, Mom, where's my birth certificate? And her mother, the mother sort of shuddered. And she said, Joey, sit down. And he said, all I want is my birth certificate. I want to got something to tell you. I don't, you don't, you don't have to tell me anything. Just give me my birth certificate. He sat down and she told him that everything was a lie. That the birth date they had given him was different. Mm -hmm. That he had been born in the Soviet Union, not in the displaced persons camp. Mm -hmm. So he said, why didn't you tell me? Why this lie? And his mother said, because it, while we were in the DP camp, we were afraid that if anybody knew you were born in the Soviet Union, it would harm you, it would make it difficult for us to get yeah. to the United States, and it would harm you for the rest of your life. And that, those fears were not ungrounded. They were not, they were not yeah. ungrounded. Do you, do you know, have you read Alan Garrison's book? Do you know Alan Garrison's yeah. Lies That Matter? Yeah. It's an, uh, got to read it. It's a great, he's another highest client, former highest client, married to uh, Joan Nathan. I mean, mm -hmm. he, he passed away. Uh, about two years ago, but married to Joan Nathan, um, the um, you know the the, the cookbook. Jewish uh, cookbook author, and and um, he, in, in Lies That Matter, he tells a story about how one of his one of his first jobs out of law school was to work for the Office of Special Investigations, uh. which you know deported Nazis from the United States. That was their their job, and he was so excited, and he thought his parents would share his excitement because they were survivors mm -hmm. from Europe, and and he himself was born. You know, in Europe, um, in and and was a was a, a was born, I think, in a DP camp, right? And and so he went. He told his parents, "I got this great job. I'm going to be deporting Nazis, um, based on lies that they told to get to this country. <laughs> so I'm, you know, we'll be deporting them because they cre they they misrepresented themselves." And the parents looked incredibly worried. They were not excited for their son, and the father said. Maybe that's a good job for someone else. <laughs> because, in fact, his parents had come, come here under false names. He came here under a false name. And he only found out what his real name was when he was 13 and somebody yelled at his father in Herald Square by some other name that he wow. had never heard before. Wow. You know, so their whole story was one of, of fabricating evidence to get here. And then they, they had to straighten it out after, you know, they, they realized that they were in danger of being deported themselves. So obviously when <laughs> this is the job that he took, I mean, this was the way everybody got here and they had to. And, and what's so interesting today is they're, 
the, the refugee system right now, the refugee program right now, it's more designed about keeping people out yeah. rather than yeah. bringing mm -hmm. people in. The, there's an obsession of security and there's an obsession of fraud. Everything is fraud, everything is about fraud prevention, but the whole refugee program after the Second World War was about fraud, but it wasn't about people who were lying about their persecution, but they had to lie in order to get in under the immigration laws. Right. And to go back to the, the 1948 Displaced Persons and Refugee Act, which on paper sounds good, it lets 200,000 people into the country and ultimately 400,000, but what, but you know, when I was reading about it and the back and forth, I mean, this is the part that is so shocking, this idea that if you were, um, that they were privileging people who worked in agriculture, which then meant Jewish people, Jewish survivors, many of them were not farmers, um, and then also privileging people who had come in by December of 1945, which then made 90% of the of the Jews ineligible for this and that when you look and one of the things I love about the book is that you have big block quotes of you know senators um, debating this and, and the things that they said but basically the idea was all Jews are communists and because communists have become the enemy they can't come in, right. um, but the Nazis can come in. Nazis can come in, yeah. <laughs> so it's just there is something about reading it that you just want to like throw the book against. I mean, not your book, no offense, but like well, the, the anger that I had. And again, I knew this, I knew all of this, but there was something about kind of reading it through and then kind of thinking about, you know, luckily the Epsteins were already here, but so many people, as you said, like them, were still in camps. Yeah. Well, the the only way in the December, the, the mm -hmm. Truman. Um, declaration in December. Again, the only way to get in is if you were a German refugee mm -hmm. because the quota laws mm -hmm. privileged Germans. Germans, right? Nobody else in Eastern Europe could get in, but the Central Europeans, the Germans could get in. So if you made believe you were German, if you had papers forged that said you were German, you know, you could get in. If you, after 1948, and, and this was an incredible story, one that I didn't want to have to tell. Um, American immigration policy, American immigration law, American refugee policies and laws are based on lies, are based on misinformation, are based on disinformation. That was the case in the 1880s, when the Chinese were excluded, it was the case in the 1920s, when the quota laws were written, it was the case in 1948, when the Displaced Persons Act was written, and it has been the case ever since then. I mean, refugees today have to be kept out because they're going to bring in COVID, as if we don't have COVID here, and as if you can't test them you know, before they come in. They're drug dealers. Yeah, it's easier to test for COVID than communism. <laughs> yeah. they're, they're drug dealers, right? They're um, going to cause disruption um, if they're Muslims. Mm -hmm. We can't trust them. They're, I can go on and on and on and on. In 1948, on the floor of the Congress, any number of congressmen and the senators got up you could no longer use Hitlerian language. Mm -hmm. You had to find a new form of anti-Semitism. And that anti-Semitism was taken from Hitler, was also taken from the Pope, who blamed the Bolshevik Revolution on the Jews. Hitler blamed everything else on the Jews. And the Southern congressmen and the Midwestern Republicans, Southern Democrats, Midwestern Republicans, stood up and said, we can't let the Jews in. Why? Because lots of them spent the war in the Soviet Union. Not because they wanted to be communists, but it was the only way to get away from, from the Holocaust, from Hitler. And they have relatives in Poland. And besides, we all know that Jews are disruptors of Western civilization. They're dangerous. We can't let them in. And what happened? The law was written in such a way it took until June 1948 for the Americans to let in any displaced persons. At all. Except for, you know, the, 
25,000 that came in in December 45. Mm -hmm. We were the last nation, last nation to bring in displaced persons. And the law was written in such a way that 90% of the Jews couldn't come in. Why? Because you had to be here by December 45. Mm -hmm. The Jews who had come out of Dachau and Bergen-Belsen uh, and Ordruf, mm -hmm. the first thing they did, if they could walk, was go back home. Was they went back home, and they didn't get back into Germany. Mm -hmm. They tried to find someone living at home. They didn't get back in to Germany until 1946. The Polish Jews who had escaped, there would be no Polish Jews if they had not been able to escape into the Soviet Union. They didn't get back into Poland until 1946, and then they realized they couldn't live in Poland because the anti-Semitism was worse than it had been before the war. Yes, and so they come into Germany. And Kalman went back to Kielce. Did he? Yes, that's what I, and, and Kiltz, well, he was originally from Kiltz. I don't know if he went back there, yeah. but I imagine he did. But Kiltz is where there was a, a horrible pogrom in yeah. July, I think, of 1945, yeah. Yeah. right? So 46. 46. Okay. 46. So, I mean, in the end, and I think I get the figures from Hyas, that has the most reliable figures. Um, in the end, of the quarter million displaced, Jewish survivors in the camps between 53 and 55,000 mm -hmm. are admitted to the United States. And of those, you know, we don't know how many, they had forged papers that said they had been in the camps before December of 1945. Which is, there's no way. But they didn't but happen. And if I can just take one step further, Truman, it is said, by his advisors and by his biographers, um, had a soft, part, soft spot in his heart for Jews because was it Eddie Jacobson, his partner in a haberdashery, was a Jew. And he read the Bible and thought the Jews belonged in Palestine. Um, and that's why he recognized the state of Israel two minutes after Ben-Gurion read the Declaration of Independence. <clears throat> no. <laughs> that might be true. He wanted, he had to get the Jews out of Germany. And he saw that as the best And he couldn't get them into the United States. Mm -hmm. So he said, let's create and let us support an independent state of Israel. And that's where they can go. And of the 200,000 150 to 180,000 go to Israel. Some because they're Zionists and they want to. Others, reluctantly, mm -hmm. they'd rather be with family in Canada or in the United States. Mm -hmm. And 50,000 end up here. Mm -hmm. And you think if, if so, if we, if we were able to change history, and if in, in 1946 the U.S. doors were open, how many of those 250,000 people do you think would have, of their, of, where would they have gone? You're not allowed to ask questions. <laughs> but, 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 <laughs> but, but let me answer. I think most of the survivors, most of the Holocaust survivors, supported the state of Israel, mm -hmm. supported a homeland for the Jews, but had been through too much. Mm -hmm. They did not want to go mm -hmm. to a new state, without resources, without milk, <laughs> you know, that they feared was going to be a, in perpetual war mm -hmm. for the next generation. Mm -hmm. um, they wanted to come where they could find work, where they could find, get their children educated, where they would be safe. And that was not, mm -hmm. regrettably, Palestine or Israel. And I know Hyas at the time was working with other organizations to, to actually bring together when they were working on the legislation, right? This is a, they were working, but they had to kind of work more behind the scenes. So the Jewish organizations um, were working behind the scenes to bring Protestant groups and Lutheran groups and um, Catholic groups to kind of lead the charge. Right. 
to get that legislation passed, but then the legislation is passed and they're left on the side. And then they have to manage the people who are critiquing what had happened. I mean, right. Yeah, and this is right. I mean, Hayes really, it's interesting because we started here on the Lower East Side mm -hmm. um, and, the, and then on Ellis Island just tr as a local New York organization. And then when the United States shut its doors in 1920, 21 to, mm -hmm. to 24, we had to become international, mm -hmm. right? Because we people couldn't even get here. So we would go overseas to try to help people get here. But uh, um, like David said, when uh, because only a minority went to the United States of the last million, Hyas was trying to send them all over the world. Like we were sending them um, to you know Latin America. Many Latin American Jewish communities were really started by uh, people that we resettled there because we couldn't get them here. Um, you know, uh, South Africa, um, Australia. Australia, New Zealand, um, Canada. You know, the United States got a minority of Hyas's uh, clients because of this blatant discrimination. Yeah, and, and it, it really is, dep it's depressing for me because, um, you know, over my career, I started at kind of a high point, frankly, in, in uh, the American treatment of refugees. Like David said, the response was so slow. In 1951, the Refugee Convention was adopted. It wasn't signed onto by the United no. States until 1967. Like it took us 16 years to sign the convention. It wasn't implemented in law until 1980. But when it was implemented, it was it was um, uh, passed by the Senate unanimously, which you cannot imagine happening today, <laughs> and and by the House overwhelmingly in in a bipartisan um, you know in a bipartisan approach. And when I started my career in 1989 with Soviet Jews, you know this was at a time when you're, we brought in hundreds of thousands of Jews and Christians from the Soviet Union. Now talk about a security threat. I mean that was taking a risk, and yet we did it and. That wasn't really discussed. It was something we vetted for, but it wasn't really a major focal point. Right today, we're in a totally different situation where the entire obsession is about keeping people out for security reasons. And, and thinking about the things that David was talking about in terms of the, the obsession um, about security at that time, about Jews being untrustworthy because they're communists, um, you know, we saw this, the same thing happen in real life in November of 2015 when 31 governors in the United States came out and said, we do not want any Syrian Muslim refugees coming into our states. And I could not believe what I was hearing, because this is the first time <coughs> I'd ever heard elected officials say, we're not letting people into our states because of where they were born or their religion. And it was, you know, here we, here we go again. And we're still there. And what is it that changed, do you think? I know this is a big question, between the late 1980s when you started your career and what, what, you know, a million things have changed, but I'm just curious from your standpoint, what do you see as the source of change? Well, I mean, I think the real moment was, of course, <coughs> September 11th, right? I mean, that was the, the game cha changer. And again, there was, when, when uh, I was so proud of the way the United States responded to the crisis in, um, in northern Iraq in 1996, when we airlifted out thousands of Iraqis, brought them to Guam and processed them as asylees right then and there. And then in Kosovo, we airlifted out people from Macedonia and processed them as refugees here in the United States in, in Fort Dix. That would never happen today. And in fact, it didn't happen today, right? When refugees were fleeing Afghanistan, they didn't bring them in as refugees. Even though the quota was undersubscribed by 100,000 people, they brought them in as parolees, which is basically an undocumented immigrant who has the right to be here. And For how the, many years? Well, I mean, until, what, uh, until for as long, uh, they're at the pleasure. There's no right to be here. They're basically okay. here for two years. Two and right years. now, That's right. we're fighting to get them access to green cards because mm -hmm. they don't have the right to reunite with family. They don't have access to a green card, a permanent residence, let alone a pathway to citizenship. And the Ukrainians, you're right, it was the same thing. We had uh, the quota last year was 125,000 refugees. They only managed to admit 25,000, yet they brought in 100,000 Ukrainians as parolees with Parole, no status. Yeah. Yeah. So you're right, we're right, right back to where we began. And yet all these words of generosity you heard, actually you got them a second class status. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But the, we, we can't underestimate um, the degree to which Europeans, that there is a hierarchy mm -hmm. in refugee policy. 
large numbers of our elected officials, I don't know, of, I don't think they represent the people, but large numbers of our elected officials don't want any immigrants coming in here. Um, but they'll take Europeans who are Christian. It kind of goes back to that 1945 Gallup poll <laughs> where yeah. Scandinavians are okay. They'll, they'll take them. They'll take, next they'll take Europeans who are Jewish, reluctantly, mm -hmm. like the, from the Soviet Union. Um, but when it comes, the last million, three quarters of them were Europeans, Eastern Europeans, and Christian. One quarter were Eastern Europeans and Jewish. They had a much easier time than Africans today, mm -hmm. or than Syrians, or Muslims, or Latin Americans. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, this, this is a reality. And the difficulty with this, as with so much else, in, in 1948, responsible politicians, with the exception of a few, with the exception of Manny Seller and Jack Javits mm -hmm. and Senator Pepper from Florida, nobody stood up and said, wait a minute, <laughs> the Jews aren't communist subversives. They're not coming in here as agents of Stalin to undermine, um, they knew that that was the case, but they didn't stand up and say it. And today, how many politicians, how many congressmen have stood up and said, is it Article 44 which keeps people out? Because 42. 42? 42? Yeah, Title 42, yeah. How many elected officials who know better? How many college presidents? Mm -hmm. How many newspaper publishers? How many important people in the clergy have stood up and said, this is nonsense? Right. So it, it is a failure of nerve. It's a failure of a kind of humane response. It is a failure of sympathy and empathy. And it is a willingness to let lies stand. Yeah, yeah, bold faced lies. And yeah. administration officials keep saying, Title 42, it is not an immigration measure, it's a public health measure. They still say Using that with COVID. a straight face. Using yeah. COVID as yeah, yeah, yeah. You go to Texas, the only COVID measure in place in the state of Texas right now, and for the last two years, has been Title 42. Mm -hmm. Um, so. so, you know, and this, this kind of idea, we have, you know, I like to, my own idealism, right, of kind of growing up and thinking, moving to New York, and like the first thing I did when I moved to New York was get on a ferry to go see the Statue of Liberty. Like that was the first thing I did. Um, and so in the recent Ken Burns documentary, U.S. and the Holocaust, I think the, the statue is used really well, right, to kind of problematize this ideal that we have of this country being welcoming. But I guess my question is, with all of this, in some cases, apathy, misinformation, a lack of willingness to stand up, you know, how do we build a better understanding of an America in ideals and put it into action? So where do you in the work, so you had to do this work and write this 700 page book, like, and, and keep going and do this. You did it not because you wanted to condemn the United States. You did it, my guess is, because you think criticizing it is a way of making it better. And, you know, for you too, the work that you do every day, there's something, you have hope in you that keeps you going through all of this. I'm just curious to kind of shift gears, and we can go back to criticize and everything like that, but curious like where you find the kind of hope and your ideas for how we build a, a, a better country that matches um, the, the vision of, of the Statue of Liberty. There, there are extraordinary groups mm -hmm. and individuals in this country who 
don't get the press that they should get. Mm -hmm. um, there are lawyers and doctors and social workers and individuals with no professional standing who, I mean, when, when the buses come to New York from Texas, when they went to Massachusetts, there were people waiting there, waiting there with bags of food, with a smile, with a handshake. Um, that's who we are. And until we recognize that our history is not one that can be celebrated from top to bottom 100%. Um, we've got to understand the shortcomings, the failures in the past are still with us. And we've got to celebrate, mm -hmm. you know, Manny Seller. Mm -hmm. he, he lost his election to Liz Holtzman. And we've got to celebrate Liz Holtzman. Mm -hmm. And we've got to celebrate their highest. Mm -hmm. And we've got to celebrate the joint. Mm -hmm. And we've got to celebrate a variety of other institutions and individuals. Um, and the individuals who support yeah. the organization. Absolutely. Yeah. But just so for the viewers who might not know, I mean, I think everyone should know who Manny Seller is. But in case you don't yet know who Emanuel Seller is, he was a, a congressman who was uh, there in 1924 when the horrible Johnson Reed law was passed and he fought it with all of his might and rhetoric wasn't able to get it, but he stays in Congress and in 1965 is there when the Hart Seller name for him yeah. is, is passed. Yeah. I'm sure you know that. But. And, and, the, and the other thing is that on this argument, the, the facts are on our side. Like that's yeah. what keeps me going, uh -huh. is that we know that the anti-immigrant sentiments have been here for over 200 years, right? The, the John Adams administration, the Alien and Sedition Acts, right? This is uh, xenophobia and immigrant bashing is, and fear is nothing new in this country, right? And yet when you look at the actual track record, how many immigrants or refugees actually did bring terror into this country? <laughs> you know, I mean, they immigrants helped build this country. Um, immigrants have been an incredible asset to this country. Refugees, it's the same thing. We don't bring refugees here because we want our economy improved. But the fact is, that's what happens. Yeah. You know, we bring them here for humanitarian reasons. We bring them here because they have no other place to go. Mm -hmm. But it just so happens they're an asset. Mm -hmm that they contribute, they don't take, and they certainly don't terrorize, they've fled terror, they're not coming here to bring it. So I just keep hoping that we're gonna realize and make decisions that are based on actual facts mm -hmm. rather than irrational fears. Mm -hmm. But the mistake we've been making is that we, we just have to try to come to terms with everybody who is afraid, because a lot of people are afraid, right. and politicians right. don't ever hesitate to play on those fears and to exploit them. And we actually see it now more than we've seen it at any time in my lifetime, mm -hmm. But certainly, um, you know, it, it's been around for 200 years. Yeah. We, we've got to build uh, policies that are based on hope rather than fear. And that hope is fact-based. Mm -hmm. The fear is not. So it's not just a dream. It's that for a long time now, I think as a people, we have been you know, too often misrepresented by our elected officials. Um, we're better than they are. You know, and to that point, there is a, um, the American Historical Association did this study, I think a year ago, so hopefully it's still relevant, um, but they talked to people, both Republican and Democrat, and, and said, you know, talked about history. And what they found is that 75% of those surveyed thought that complicated history should be taught. But people had an understanding that history isn't just, right. you know, America's great and, and that it, it could be caught. But it's like that's the kind of, it's so funny because that's the kind of study, in fact, that gets buried and we don't hear about that. But that, to me, that gives hope because it goes to your point that there's, if we kind of understand the complexities of history, we're better able to deal with the complexities of the history yeah. today. And that, you know, just in the same way as therapy, you have to talk about the bad things in order, you know, to move forward. Um, one other thing, though, but because facts aren't always things that people can avoid <coughs> because of fear. Um, and, and 
I'm wondering about the kind of what happens with like kind of personal interactions and the role of like people and the studies that have done that showing that people who actually know immigrants or that there's immigrants in their city, like there's a better situation than if people who are, you know, living far away from immigrants. But, you know, the way your book kind of plays on that in a, in a, in a way, in the sense that even though you're using all sorts of archival sources and congressional speeches and, and all the kind of uh, hardcore historical sources, you're also weaving throughout the personal testimonies of people who are uh, refugees or the children of refugees. So I just wanted you to speak a little bit to that, kind of how you found the stories to tell and why you used those stories and what they added in your mind to the well, work. They, they make it, you know, they make it real. As mm -hmm. I said, I don't want to tell a history that's based on congressional debates. I don't want to tell a history that doesn't have those okay. congressional debates, but it can't be limited to those. There's a human story here. There are so many human stories. Um, people have gotten in touch with me, as, as mm -hmm. our friends here have, to say that this is the history of their family. I've had three people get in touch with me because they recognized in the photographs, oh, that's so you know, great. relatives. Um, this is human history. This is real history. I, I end the book by, regrettably for the history, but fortunately for me, because I don't like to interview living people, I much prefer to talk about people who are no longer with us. Well, they can't contradict. Well, they can't contradict. <laughs> and, you know, it, that's just the way, the way I work. And most of the displaced persons um, had passed away. I met through a friend of a friend of a friend, um, Itzik Lachman and his wife. He was 99 and she was 97. Wow. And they had met, he thinks, in Poland when he was 16 and she was 14 at a resort where the Jews went and waved at each other and made Google eyes at each other. Um, and both of them had been through several camps. Um, Itzik survived because he was a locksmith and a carpenter and he knew that he had to somehow make himself of use to the uh, Nazi commandants. They ended up at Dachau, and Lola, her name was Lola, her twin sister died of um, cholera, one of the diseases that was raging through the camp. And as a result, Lola would never talk about what had happened. Never. She never told her children anything, she never talked about it. But it did. Um, the two of them met at one of the camps, I, I've forgotten my book, I think at Landsberg, mm -hmm. and Itzik had worked for Nazis, and he wanted to work for people he loved and knew, so he said to the camp, the American occupation forces, he said, what can I do? Give me something to do. And they said, well, in the girls' dormitory, we need bunk beds. And, I mean, this is a story out of the movies, but it's real. He goes into the girls' dormitory and he sees this now 20-year-old Lola. Um, and according to the story, they recognize one another. And they, they soon marry and they have two children in the camps. And then, because a chaplain, these are the, the heroes, the, a Jewish chaplain, a they, they all, when the camps are liberated, they abandon, they just go AWOL. They say, the hell with the army. The soldiers don't need us. The war's over. We're going to spend our time with the Jews, with the displaced people. And this chaplain goes through the camps, and he says, do you have any relatives anywhere? And Itzik says, well, I think I have a cousin somewhere in Brooklyn, New Jersey, um, and a letter is written, and it appears in all the Yiddish newspapers, 
and the cousin picks it up in the forwards. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. And gets in touch and takes care of the family, and they, they immigrate in 49 or 50. So I'm, I'm interviewing him. I, I apologize for this being such a long story. I, I'm interviewing him, and his wife has had a stroke. She can't talk anymore. And he, he looks at her. The, the major problem between the two of them now is that he has no short-term memory. So he'll ask her a question and forget that she can't talk mm -hmm. and get angry. And someone will have to come in and say, it's, it. mm -hmm. it's not that she doesn't want to talk to you. So they're sitting together. And he looks at me and he says, it's a good life. Wow. He says, it's a good life. Mm -hmm. He says, my cousins took care of me. He says, I have children. Mm -hmm. I have grandchildren. I've been married for 70 years. He said, it's a good life. One of the things I came away with in writing this book that kept me pushing through it, and the reason I had to tell these stories, is that these survivors are remarkable people. Mm -hmm. Their courage, their mission, their sense that they have to resurrect from the ashes literally from mm -hmm. the ashes, a Jewish community mm -hmm. and keep alive the memories of their, of the dead. Um, I mean, we have to honor them. Um, and when we tell Bella's story, um, one of the things Bella's, uh, Bella's the daughter of Kalman, one of the daughters of, of Kalman and Rivka, and they passed away around 1986, so we were never able to talk to Kalman and Rivka, so we know everything about them through Bella. So I would just add that in addition to the survivors, their children their offer children, carry yeah. this yeah. really, you know, this sense of history, even when, and in the case of Bella, the parents did not talk about what had happened at all, and she, you know, in this very you know, dining room on Saturday nights, the, the family would come over, uh, friends would come over, they'd speak in Yiddish, smoke cigarettes, sit at the table, and she'd listen from her bedroom and kind of piece things together about what that story had been. And then she, you know, shared that story with us and all of its different, um, different details and the texture of that growing up on the Lower East Side. But then one of the things that I have found most rewarding is telling the story of Bella to high school kids, college kids, who will relate that they're not Jewish, but they are the children of refugees, or they are the children of people who have gone through trauma and do not speak of it. And so they relate to this story and this world in which there's a, the parents have some kind of like hidden past that right. isn't that mm -hmm. it isn't tapped into. Well, so thinking about how that relates, that dynamic, that dynamic can connect. Well, it, it has to be done. I mean, the, the last thing we mm -hmm. we should do is we should deal with. We, we can't characterize these refugees, whether they're Syrian or Venezuelan or, or Jewish, as victims, mm -hmm. as passive victims. These are brave people, and they deserve our help. They don't often reach out for it, you know. Um, they have agency. Yeah, yeah, and you would experience that. Oh, absolutely! I, I was on a I was on a discussion with Mandy Patinkin, the mm -hmm. the actor, and there were refugees on the discussion, and he was he got on a high horse and was saying that uh, you know it's important to give voice to the voiceless. Yeah. And one of the refugees said, "I have a voice." Yeah. It's like the people have to listen to me. That wonderful. Yeah, and it really humbled him. Now every time Mandy talks, he talks about that story and how that woke him up. And I think, too, one thing I wanted to note, because I don't know if everyone in the audience knows it, but Hayas had started as a Jewish organization and at the time the 1940s was, but at a certain point in the 1970s started, basically moved away from only helping Jewish refugees to broaden and help all refugees. Is that, was it? Uh, it's a little more complicated, more complicated. than that. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, during, during the, during the uh, Indochina boat crisis, the, the Southeast Asian refugee crisis, we did resettle Southeast Asian refugees for sure, and uh, on both sides of, of the ocean. 
but then in the that the Soviet Jewish emigration became so overwhelming, plus the Iranian Jewish emigration, so that really became our almost sole focus in during the, 80s, the 1980s um, through the, the first half of the 1990s. So it really, we only went back to really being a humanitarian organization, helping refugees, not because they're Jewish, but because we are. Mm -hmm. In, uh, in, the, in the early 2000s, mm -hmm. we started to make that shift, and now we have made it um, completely. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, the good thing is, yes, there's a lot of anti-Semitism right now. Uh, there's mm -hmm. no question about that, but there are not j so many Jews who are destitute and fleeing, which mm -hmm. for most of our existence, that was the case. Even when I started my career helping Soviet Jews, they left with $80 in a suitcase, and that was it. They had nothing else, and they were stateless, so they had no passport no possessions, and so they needed ISIS help. Now, Jews who are dealing with anti-Semitism have access to resources that the other people that we helped did not, but many refugees do not have that. And one thing in a conversation we had previously is that you know, even as, as hard as the situation is today, it has opened up more room for communities and individuals to help more actively. Is that there? That's a more recent in the last year. Yeah. Now it, it's uh -huh. interesting that after the Refugee Act of 1980 that I talked about, which mm -hmm. implemented the Refugee Convention, you know, the refugee resettlement became very professionalized, for better or mm -hmm. for worse, and so tens of thousands, sometimes you know, over a hundred thousand refugees would come to this country. It would be resettled through this professional resettlement infrastructure, including HIAS and the eight other national refugee agencies, and it became very kind of behind the scenes, not very grassroots oriented. But then in 2015, with the refugee crisis uh, in the Middle East and then to Europe, it woke everybody up, and it, we became much more grassroots focused. And then with the Afghan crisis, when they brought 80,000 Afghans here in the course of a few w weeks, at a time when our resettlement um, infrastructure had been eviscerated by the Trump administration with one third of all resettlement sites closed and the others down to a skeleton staff, um, you know, we had to be creative. And so we cr highest created welcome circles around the country in places where we didn't have resettlement sites. We had welcome circles with Jewish congregations and, mm -hmm. and others did similar things. So we, we had this kind of private sponsorship approach to refugee reception um, in addition to the, the mm -hmm. formal network. That, another sign of hope too, the way that people are stepping up to do. Right, I mean, when I, when I took this job at highest, I said my biggest problem was apathy, like mm -hmm. apathy in the Jewish community mm -hmm. and apathy in the larger community toward mm -hmm. refugees. That's not in my top 10 mm -hmm. anymore. Right yeah. now, it's the reverse of that, it's mm -hmm. polarization. Mm -hmm. It's refugees, you either love them or you hate them. And I have to deal with both of those mm -hmm. groups. Um, I want to make I want to make sure we have time for questions for the audience, but wondering if you have any last reflections you want to make, or if you want to make them through the Q and A. You're good. You're good. Okay. <laughs> um, do we have any questions in the room? Well, this is definitely. Oh, do we, we just get a microphone? Yeah. Sorry. As we said, this was definitely our parents' story, and a story that we knew well, but we didn't understand the kind of geopolitical context of it. And, um, it, and one of the questions I always had about my own family was my mother, who survived the war in Russia. Um, and when we came to the United States, that her her survival always was a little bit of a secret, and when very late, I mean, in the 1990s, we were literally on our way to a television program, and my father turned to me. And we were going to participate in this program about um, survivors and children, and my father turned to me and said, "We're not going to mention your mother was in Russia." <laughs> I, I couldn't understand why. He said, "We're just going to say she went to the east." And when I read your book, I realized why. But what I wondered about was, I wondered if there were any documents that they might have had to fill out that she had not mentioned that in, and that's what they were so worried about. So I didn't know if you knew when people applied to come here. We came here legally. They did not change their names or anything. Yeah. I wondered if there was something that she held secret in those documents that might have made them nervous. In was there, could, where was she married? Where they, they were married in Poland. You yeah. sure? 
Oh, yes. Because they could have yes. been married. Yeah? No, they were married in Poland. I was born in Poland. They were yeah. married in Poland. Yeah. Okay. They were married they, in Szczecin. They met in Szczecin. Oh, really? Actually, mm -hmm. Also, your book answered a question for me as to what were they doing there. Now I know what they were doing yeah. there and, and, and why my sister was born there. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There, there were any number of things. I don't know if there were official documents, um, but they may have been interviewed at some point by, by immigration officials said, where were you during the war? You know, what did you do? And they may have, through omission, said nothing, or they, they might have lied. Um, the, nobody wanted to, and, and it stayed with these people. You know, it stayed with this generation. This fear that had, that they were going to be labeled communists and they were going to be sent back. Uh, well, they were well, very aware of that because my mother, who was educated in Russia and had a very good education there, said that my grandfather would not allow her to bring a single textbook back to Poland from Russia. She had to leave all her books behind, her poetry books, which she loved. She, could, she memorized Russian poetry. She could still recite it. And yet none of those were allowed to come back with her. Yeah. So that's how early they were aware of that Russian, that, that communist um, element. So did you have any... I guess more just a comment. There was just the discussion was wonderful. So much food for thought, and I just wanted to say that I read this book in the same year that I read *The Warmth of Other Suns* by Isabel Wilkerson, and I, I, I can't. I, it was to read those two books in the same year. Um, you know, and we were just kind of talking about, you know, deep-seated prejudices and and hope for the future and. You know, I, I, you know, I, I thought about the fact that my our father um, always felt like this was he lived in the in Philadelphia, in the best city, in the best country in the world, <laughs> and he raised us to, to he raised us to believe that America had opened <coughs> welcomed them with open arms, and um, and he was very very grateful to this to this country. Um, and when I read this book and reading also The Warmth of Other Suns in the same year, I realized that the America that my father believed in wasn't really the America that they came to. Okay. And, um, but I think that he, I think at some level he also knew that. I think that he, he told us those things because he wanted us to believe them. He wanted us to have hope. For the future, we were that hope, and and I think, but but um, you know, it, it's very much as you said, the survivor community was a, was really an amazing community, and not just for what they did, um, and not just for what they represented, but for for what they believed about this country. I think, and and their idealism. So, just a comment, really. And uh, hello, I just want to add some questions from the chat. And before I do, I want to say there was a lot of uh, thanks, a lot of praise, a lot of sharing of personal connections, both uh, to Hyas and to the history that's explored in this book. Um, but one of the questions was, uh, are the records of the DP camps available if people want to do their own uh, genealogical research through them? Yes. Yes. It's, it's not always easy. <laughs> but um, there are extraordinary records um, at the YIVO, at YIVO and at the um, American Jewish, Jewish Historical Society, which is on uh, 12th the, Street? Uh, no. 16th Street, 16th Street. 5th and 6th. Yeah. At the, did I say 16th? 15th, 16th Street. 15, yeah. 16th Street, between 5th and 6th Avenue. It's called the Center for Jewish History, but the archive the archives within it are YIVO, especially YIVO, right? Yeah. The DP camp, um, they have a whole collection of, of it's a, it's DP camp. extraordinary and, materials. And Hyas is at both oh, right. YIVO and yeah. the And the Holocaust Museum in, yeah. in Washington has extraordinary materials. Mm -hmm. It's not easy to do this kind of research. Um, it requires sometimes a little Yiddish to, to get through. Um, or a little German, or a little Russian, um, but but it can be done. Excellent, thank you. You might have to lie. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, there was another question, uh, again, about someone's you know, uh, parents or grandparents. Were the quotas from this time period simply based on uh, nation of birth, or was race, ethnicity also taken into account? No, it was, it was um, nation of birth, which was determined by race and ethnicity. Um, it, it was a, you know, you look at the figures and you just want to scream, especially for, for Eastern Europe. Uh, the American Congress in the 1920s didn't want any Eastern Europeans or Southern Europeans. There are enough here already, no more. And one final question. Um, are there other countries that are more willing to accept refugees? And if they are so, how, um, why are they more successful at, at settling them and accommodating them? Yeah, that, that's a complicated question. But the short answer is yes, there are other countries. Uh, frankly, I think Canada has a, has a better appreciation for the value of immigrants and refugees than our country does. Um, and you'll remember at a time in the 2016 election when um, all the republic and I, I don't want to be partisan here, but the fact of the matter is that the polarization of that election, you know, you had 14 primary Republican candidates all saying to keep Muslim Syrians out, and you had three Democratic candidates running for the primary all saying to bring in more Syrian refugees and criti were criticizing Obama for, for that reason. But while this was going on in Canada, you had, you know, um, you had Trudeau, Justin Trudeau, who actually won the election in part on his promise to bring in more Syrian refugees, right? And of course, immigration politics in Canada is, is, is complicated, but it's, it's a much, they take a more welcoming approach than, than we have. Um, and, and likewise, in, in, in even Germany. I mean, in Germany, um, they've taken a more kind of rational approach, understanding that immigrants and refugees are assets and, and actually, because of the aging population, this is one of Merkel's uh, motivations. Because of the aging population of Germany, they realized that, that, that refugees truly are an asset to Germany. And we're filling needs beyond uh, just, just uh, it wasn't just Germany being humanitarian, it was filling economic needs within Germany. Right? So every now and then, kind of a reason appears in the immigration debate <laughs> in some of these other countries. Um, but then there's a backlash. And there was a backlash in Germany after that. Uh, Sweden, it was the same thing. Uh, there was generosity followed by a backlash. Um, these things are always cyclical. But I think at a snapshot in time right now, you, I, I could say Canada uh, gets the prize. Excellent. Thank you. And once again, just want to pass on the appreciation of you both and this um, talk from the chat. Thank you. Thank you, Dolan. Um, I sent my daughter to college in Canada, so maybe that's the, <laughs> the answer. Um, but you know, I think one of the things we, we do, we try to do at the Tenement Museum is tell the history of this country, both moments of inclusion and exclusion through the stories of right. over a dozen different families. And I think that, you know, when people come here and are able to hear the stories of the people who lived in the actual spaces that they're talking, there's this kind of, again, they're bringing with them their knowledge and their understanding of what's going on today. So the conversations that kind of play out in these rooms also gives me hope thinking about kind of how we take history and how we kind of build a, a, a inclusive and um, pluralist well, it, American society. It, you know, institutions like the Tenement Museum are absolutely necessary. This is a, <coughs> we are a nation built by immigrants and we are a nation that fears immigrants. And it's the first part of that, the nation building uh, the immigrant as assets, mm -hmm. that has to be emphasized mm -hmm. over and over and over again. And alongside, to bring in Eleanor's point um, about the Great Migration and the warmth of other sons, a nation that was built as well by those who had been enslaved. Yeah. So like, the more we remember these complicated histories, put them in conversation, the better. Um, so I want to so, so buy this book, The Last <coughs> Time, it's wonderful. Support Hyas for the work it does and support the Tenement Museum if you can or be a member um, and uh, come visit us. Thank you both so much for this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.